there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News. I'm Rick Wiles, and you're listening to one hour of uncensored news and views. Well, here's an anniversary I'm confident you don't have marked on your calendar. The 35th anniversary of the Jonestown Massacre. It's coming up November 18. Most people old enough to remember it have forgotten it. And most people too young to remember it never heard of it. And if you're among those who never heard of it, I'll just tell you quickly, the Jonestown Massacre was the name given to the mass suicide of over 900 people living in Ghana at the People's Temple Agricultural Project led by Reverend Jim Jones. 907 people died from cyanide poisoning in an event called Revolutionary Suicide. Five others died at a nearby airstrip, including... U.S. Congressman Leo Ryan. My guest today is a recognized expert on cult mentalities. Mr. David Kahn was the co-author of a book published in 1980 titled The Cult That Died, The Tragedy of Jim Jones and the People's Temple. He recently published a new book called The Pleasure of Fiends, an Orthodox Study of Evil and the Meaning in the Jonestown Cultic Horror. His website is truthsleuth.net. Mr. Kahn, welcome to True News. Well, fine. Thank you. I'm glad to be aboard. We're going to have an interesting discussion because uh, I think most people don't realize that that same Jonestown uh, cult mentality that existed and and moved its way through California because those people did not see the meaning of it, that same cult mentality, and I warned about this for the last 30 years, would be would uh, would grow and increase and and reemerge on a grand national level. And that, I think, uh, is what I saw in 2006 when I first saw this uh, young, charismatic uh, senator in Illinois. And then I, I wrote an article uh, called Jonestown, Its Portent Has Arrived. And in that, I stated that I felt that at last that, that, uh, that Obama is the reemergence of the Jones cult mentality on a grand national level. And I, and I documented that years ago. Oh, this is going to be a really good interview. I didn't even know we were going to go there. And I, I, now I can't wait. Um, let's start, David. Let's start at, at the beginning. I, I understand you started investigating... Jim Jones, 11 years before the Jonestown Massacre. Is that is that true? No, it, w- it was almost nine years, eight years and uh, ten months. Okay, so so you, but you were on to this guy almost a decade before anybody heard of him. Yes, that's true. And, and uh, I was just a, a simple guy with a simple uh, job working at, in the environmental lab of, of uh, what was then Standard Oil, the big environmental lab. I was a lead analyst with them. And so two of my close friends came to me within two weeks of one another. The first friend was telling me what a great and majestic leader this Jim Jones was, that he was like a new saint, and he was going to just be, be the living end to society's problems. And, the, and then a couple of weeks later, another close friend, both of these guys I knew for 15 years, were very close friends. And this second guy came to me and said, this, there's a minister up there in Redwood Valley that is doing weird things with my ex-wife and kids. That's what he said. And so I thought, wow, this is, uh, this is something that leaves me in a dilemma. 
So that's what forced me then to travel up north uh, for two hours, two and a half hours up to Redwood Valley near Ukiah, California, and take a look at this at this minister. And uh, it was just astounding what I saw. And I, uh, because when I first walked into the auditorium and sat down, I took an aisle seat. And then a little later, when Jim Jones came to the pulpit, the very first thing he did was point to me and ask me to stand up. Uh, I suppose it was because he had people out in the foyer looking for people who were, were, were dressed not typically. I, I went up there with a suit and tie. And and then he, he began to ask me questions. Why was I there and all? So I simply said, well, I'd heard about him, and I thought I would come up and uh, and see him. And then uh, <clears throat> he uh, and then shortly after that, then he started his healings and these weird things where people would come forward, women would come forward, and they would be sent to the. Uh, to the bathroom, and then he would have his nurses extract a tumor, and then they would parade it out, and the nurses would parade it up the aisle, this tumor. And so when the nurse came up the aisle near me, I stepped out of my seat and went over to take a close look at it, and she swept it away from me and and, uh, rushed off the aisle. When I saw all that going on, I came back and I told my friends, this is a real charlatan, and he is a, he is a, a, also a radical liberal. And putting the t- two together, I saw a dangerous, dangerous thing that was about to happen. What, what made you think that he was a radical liberal? Oh, uh, for one thing, he uh, he went on about uh, 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 extreme social welf- welfare and community action, and also. He was not uh, really a, 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 a thoroughgoing, solid Christian. He uh, he talked about the the God of the Old Testament was uh, not a not a great God, and I, I, I as he went on and talked about social problems, I could just see it coming out, and I and I that there's no doubt about that. He earlier on went into great detail about uh, community uh, uh, organizing and all that stuff. And then, he, and, and then <clears throat> it was proven to be because later, uh, within a year or two, he was well institutionalized in the San Francisco political system, hobnobbing with, with the mayor and uh, other big politicians. And and also one of the, he hobnobbed very very intensely with with one of the more radical leaders in San Francisco, the uh, uh, Cecil Williams, head of the Glide Memorial Methodist Church, and he was a, a radical community organizer. Uh, he he eventually sent many of his uh, minions uh, out to various communities in California who became uh, pastors. And, uh, you know, many of them were uh, homosexuals and uh, who were parading the homosexual activist uh, agenda. So it was, it, was, it, was pretty, it was pretty clear to me uh, early on. And then I really got intensely into investigate him, investigating him. And then I, and then I, when I got, when I gathered some really incredible details, I ultimately found out exactly how he was able to overwhelm people with his cleverness and his and his so-called uh, uh, prescient abilities to forecast things and understand what people were going through. How, how did he do it? He. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to contact a family early on who told me <clears throat> this woman, uh, it turns out that her husband uh, was was one of the guys that contacted me, the first guy that contacted me to tell me what a great guy Jones was. And so they uh, uh, he took three of their kids up with him to the cult <clears throat> in uh, in. Uh, in, in Ukiah, in Redwood Valley. And uh, so that the mother decided to go up t- to visit her kids. And so, uh, but she left her oldest daughter home. And 
so on her uh, she was uh, when she went up there and she arrived there she then was uh, a- 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 asked to stand up in a similar way that I was strangely and Jones then began to tell her very strange things about her, her daughter's boyfriend well it turns out that while she was traveling up to uh, to Redwood Valley two and a half hours north her daughter at home received a call from from a person who was representing himself as a, a uh, invest, looking into the problems of people, and they they were a Baptist group. He said, and so he began to ask her questions. Well, her boyfriend had come over that morning, and when he heard what was going on, he he was a person with a, a an intensely uh, imaginative sense of humor. So he took the phone over because he realized this is very strange. And he and he outlined a lot of made-up problems that he had, all sorts of problems, uh, drug use, all, and he went on and on. And it turns out that that's exactly what Jones told the mother when she was up there in, in Ukiah at the, at the meeting. He told her all sorts of things about this, the, her daughter's boyfriend and the problems he had. Well, this made no sense to her because he was a, he was a, a, a fine young man. I mean, I, I knew his uncle, in fact. And so when she when she drove back home, she came into the into the house and said to her daughter, "This is amazing." Jim Jones started telling me all sorts of things going on with uh, with uh, with your boyfriend Rick. And that's when her daughter said, well, did he tell you this and did he tell you that? And she says, yes, yes. What is going on? Well, that proved to me then the whole agenda that Jones had set up to find information on people. And then he would later tell them about it. And this went on all over the place. And and the other thing that he did was have some of his uh, of his uh, cohorts uh, – uh, go to people who were who were saying that they wanted to come up and see Jones. He got their names and stuff and addresses, and then he would have people stop by accidentally, go into the uh, knock on the door and ask if they could uh, use their phone because they had car trouble, and then the, then these people would let them in the in the house, and then they would go and ask if they could use the bathroom. Then they would go in. And they would look in the medicine cabinet and start seeing all the medical problems they had. And then they would observe things in the living room and see dolls that were on the uh, over the fireplace. And these people took notes, took back to Jones. So then when they arrived up there, Jones would divine all this stuff. <clears throat> it's, uh, it, it's an age-old uh, process, really, uh, done by uh, so-called... Uh, uh, Claire, Claire, on, on Claire, yeah, it's like a clairvoyant, uh, yeah, a mind it, reader. He, but he yeah, was, he, he was, he was devoting tremendous amount of resources and time oh, to very yes. cleverly and and deceptively gathering oh, personal yes. information on people that he knew was planning to come see him, so that when they right. arrived, he could he could prophesy about them. Yeah, right. And this went on. Uh, wow great extent because Jones had a lot of money because it would, the, the cult members that were there would sign over their property to him. So he, 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 he began to just grow enormously fast with all sorts of money. And so he, he was able to send people out to all these people. That, and you can see how that would expand. And then those people were just enthralled. It was amazing. You know, David, whenever there is a, a cult like this, the mainstream news media always portrays them as quote right wing religious fanatics. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, the, but the truth I, is, the truth is, Jim Jones was far left. He was. He was a Marxist from the word go. Even even in uh, in college, he was uh, he, he was uh, interested in very left wing things and read Marx. It was back in Indiana. When he uh, when he went really got off 
really off base and started his cult activities back there. But then certain people in the media uh, started to question him and look into him a little bit. But that's when he uh, connected with the uh, big Disciples of Christ denomination. That's the seventh largest denomination in the, in America. And he then made inroads with them, and and they ultimately then, because they were a very liberal church group too, they then ordained him. And then he he, uh, the, he went out to the West Coast because he realized and understood their church polity, that they allowed the local ministers to have complete autonomy, no no tie to the hierarchy uh, and its regulations. Because they they were uh, they were just a simple uh, ground ground level authority in their churches. They so so no, he managed to get a covering over his cult. That's it, and and this is another thing <clears throat> that has never come out. In fact, as I you know, after the first book was published, that's when I started my. Uh, uh, investigation into why he was allowed to go that long, and then I then I uh, simply found out that his connections at all levels, all levels, were very liberal people, and that that's the that's the. Uh, well, let's talk about that because uh, the, the 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 trail takes you to a who's who of the West Coast uh, Democratic Party leftist activists. Uh, uh, Network, yeah, and 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 that's the that's the thing I, I I I'm trying to get out to the public now, because it turns out that of the hundreds of books and articles and movies and documentaries, none of them none of them dealt with what it was that allowed him to go that long. That none of them dealt with his political ties to the liberal uh, establishment. Uh, in 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 the media, in in the in the new age religious movement, and and with uh, the academics, all those he had uh, ties to, and they were the ones that covered him, and especially so, the uh, the what is tantamount to a bishop of the Disciples of Christ Church here in uh, in uh, California. Whenever Jones, somebody started to look into him, that minister, that bishop, would come out to the media and make amazing statements as to what a, a powerfully uh, good leader he is and, and all his uh, community uh, enterprises and all that. And it just overwhelmed. And But finally, I got in touch with one journalist, Lester Kinsolving, who was a, who was a, a very uh, he, he was a conservative. Let's state it. He was, let, he was let, a let's, I know less conservative. Yeah. All right. And uh, and he, he's, he's still going strong yes, up he there is. in Washington. And he works uh, with uh, WND dot com. Yeah. Right. And so uh, I, I met with him one night and unloaded this background and everything I had found out about Jones because he was just starting to uh, look into Jones, too, because he was a journalist with the San Francisco Examiner. And so he ended up, after that, uh, basing a lot of the things he had found on, on information that I had given him. But he then went into his own research, and he finally got together with, his, uh, with, his pub, uh, with the examiner, and they did... Eight, uh, eight of Lester Kinsolving's articles, eight articles. But after the first four were published, uh, Jones found out about it. And this is uh, amazing. He then came down with hundreds of his cult members and surrounded the San Francisco Examiner. And uh, he also threatened big lawsuits. It was to such an extent that the examiner then backed off and did not publish the last four articles. But there, but all eight are available on the Internet for people that are interested. But that, that shows the power that Jim Jones had, and also high-level people. Who, who, like, were so, who were some of the high-level people that befriended him, protected him, and advanced him? Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader. Uh, Har- Harvey Milk. 
the, the, the gay Harvey Milk, the, the, the gay city councilman of San Francisco who was shot and killed. Yes, right. And the mayor, Moscone, and uh, and Willie Brown, the uh, the young uh, assemblyman. Yeah, who, who way, became the speaker of the California Assembly and then mayor yeah, of San Francisco. Right. And here is something that practically none of the public, and it's just a, a case of where the mayor sent Willie Brown up to the Sacramento State Legislature to uh, to push through a special bill that would allow the mayor to bypass his board of supervisors and appoint Jim Jones directly to this big position of head of the San Francisco Housing Commission, and that and that's in fact two years two years ago I attended a meeting in Sacramento where Willie Brown was in a, uh, was to debate Dr. Frank Luntz. You know, on the uh, you know, often on the Hannity show, Frank mm-hmm. Luntz. Sure. And during that debate, uh, Doctor Luntz uh, said to Willie Brown, he said, he said, Mr. Speaker, I'd like you to I'd like you to tell me candidly. And at that point, Willie Brown interrupted for a moment to say, Doctor Luntz, I want you to know that I am always candid. And at that point. Just shortly thereafter, I raised my hand and I said to Dr. Luntz, uh, Dr. Luntz, uh, I'd like for a moment just to deal with that question where the, uh, the speaker said he was candid. And then I turned to Willie Brown and I said, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, do you recall back during the Jonestown event that the mayor of San Francisco sent a young politician up to the legislature to pass a special bill that will allow him to bypass his board of supervisors and re- and appoint Jim Jones directly to the Housing Commission. And then I said, Mr. Speaker, you and I know who that man was, don't we? You know, he, he was unaware. I told him later after that meeting that I had a copy of his special bill sponsored by Willie Brown. And so uh, but at that time, when I said that, he, he said, I have no idea what you're talking about. So that was that, smooth liar. And then after the meeting, I went up to Willie Brown, put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, Mr. Speaker, surely you remember that uh, you went to that uh, to the legislature and pushed through this special bill. I have a copy of the bill sponsored by you. And I also talked to another uh, politician in Sacramento about this years ago, and he looked up all the legislation that came about after that, and it was tied directly to to your uh, to your legislation, in which it said in that special bill, it said the mayor can can bypass his board of supervisors and appoint certain people directly to high positions. David, just, why why was Willie Brown another? Top level California Democrats pushing so hard to advance Jim Jones. That goes right to my point. Jim Jones also got uh, got got enormous uh, power by by way of his hundreds of cult members there in San Francisco. He was the one responsible for the mayor being elected and other. Uh, Willie Brown too, so they knew they were they were uh, indebted to him because he got them elected. He had his cult members go all these precincts and vo- and put in vote after vote. And here's another irony that the public doesn't know about. A little later, they started to when they started to look into voter fraud. Uh, it, it turns out that. Uh, they had uh, when they went to get the voter all, all the voter voting uh, material in the basement of the city hall it turns out that all those had disappeared and also i should mention this jones's high level aide was an attorney and he was appointed in the district attorney's office there in san francisco to the very position 
over voter fraud. So Jones's own right man, right hand man, was the attorney over voter fraud in San Francisco. Can you imagine how bizarre this whole thing is? Yeah, because I see I see how bizarre things have become nationally. Yeah. Uh, so and, and it, that's it, another thing I will we'll go into a little later because all the parallels. When I saw this young young uh, senator in Illinois, I realized that he was what I had been warning about all these years. All right. Well, let's let's hold that. And let's let's go now to, um, wh- you know, what happened. What was going on in in. Guyana, and that led to the mass suicide? Well, two or three of my major sources when I was doing my investigation, uh, they were ones that has finally escaped from the cult. But they, they didn't go hundreds of miles away, as Jones uh, said they had to. Uh, so they stayed there in Berkeley, and they then got in touch with... Uh, some of uh, Congressman Ryan's aides. And so that's when Congressman Ryan met with them and got all this inside information. So the media, again, was wrong because after the after the congressman was was killed, the media made it out that the congressman Ryan went down there without any information as to what was going on. That's an absolute falsehood because Congressman Ryan knew more than even the people in Washington knew because he met with with these sources of mine and got all the behind the scenes story. And uh, what, so, why, so uh, what did Congressman Ryan know? He he knew uh, that uh, there were beatings and that uh, there that Jones was uh, had had. Families moved around, and he moved the kids who were getting too close to their parents up there. He would move them to another family. And uh, one one was a terrible beating of a young lady. And... Uh, and also on his, on his outings, this was this was uh, uh, Congressman Ryan was was became aware of this that Jones would would have kids on their outings and their picnics and stuff uh, uh, would had to eat uh, bugs and lizards and if they threw up they had to eat their own vomit outrageous stories like this and also. He uh, Ryan was aware of, of the shenanigans that he would pull just all over the place. One example was that during an, a, a picnic in the outing up there in Redwood Valley, suddenly there was a rifle shot, and Jones clasped his chest, and there was just a bloody spot there, and his aides then rushed him inside the building. And then shortly after that, they they brought him out, and the nurse held his shirt high, sticking her finger through the bullet hole, supposedly. And it was all a charade. They, they, uh, and, uh, and the people just thought he was able to heal himself from a bullet wound. It takes pretty vulnerable people to believe that. But that's the kind of thing that, that Congressman Ryan was, was uh, told about. Mm-hmm. So he knew when he went down there that he was going up against an outrageous fraud. But he conducted himself uh, diplomatically, of course, didn't let him know all that he knew about him. What, what happened in the shooting of the congressman at the airport, at the airstrip? Uh, there were two planes that were there awaiting to take the entourage away. And when, uh, when Jones... Uh, found out that that Ryan was going to take two or three of his cult members back with him, he knew he was doomed. So he then sent his uh, henchmen out on a flatbed truck out to the airport. So they arrived there as they were all waiting to board these planes. They arrived there, and they had uh, machine guns, and then they they just started shooting people up like mad. Mm Mm-hmm. It's it's an irony here because back during the uh, you know be, 
in my investigation in the latter part of it, when I found out in the last week that that Congressman Ryan was going to go all the way out from Georgetown, Guyana, all the way out to Jonestown, I again got in touch with my uh, people at, at the Examiner, Nancy Dooley and Tim Reiterman. But Reiterman, it turned out, was going down with with Congressman Ryan. But Nancy Reiterman, the other journalist, was still there in San Francisco. And I phoned her desperately saying, look, uh, I, I've been studying this Jim Jones's mind for almost nine years. And I can tell you that I know that Jim Jones has some kind of a plan of action. I don't know what it is, but I know he has some plan of action. And we've got to get in touch with Congressman Ryan and warn him. And I said, because I believe that Ryan is not going to come out of Guyana alive. Wow. I said that very soon. And after that, it turns out I tried to get in touch with Nancy Dooley. And after that, turned out that she had quit, and I never could find out where she went. But I think she was so devastated, because I wanted to tell her, there's nothing really you could have done done about it, but I just, I just felt so desperate. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to kind of ease her mind that it wasn't really her fault, because there's nothing could have been done about it. David, it was, for years there, there has been speculation that uh, Jones, uh, the Jonestown... Uh, massacre was uh, was somehow a oh, a CIA operation by the CIA. Yes, Ab- absolutely. It's just not true at all. However, Jones constantly told people that he had outrageous connections with all sorts of high level people, and uh, that played into it. But, but but in a sense, he did because in California he was he was deeply connected to the Democratic Party hierarchy. Oh yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah that's true. But but, but you're but saying you, Jones you, Jones embellished uh, his connections, and so he deliberately told people that he was highly connected. Yeah, to right. people in positions in, in of power. Fact, he was he was highly connected in one one way because it's 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 barely known by the public that he had connections to uh, Rosalind Carter, uh, Jimmy Carter's wife. And, in fact, she was so enthralled with him that she had a special dinner at a posh San Francisco hotel, just a private dinner with him and, his, and her entourage. Rosalind Carter had a private dinner with Jim Jones. Oh, yes. And she not only had that, but she, she went on and on. She actually spoke from his pulpit. Okay, and, this is getting straight. So how do we know Jonestown was not some type of of mind control experiment uh well it, it it's a specious uh portrayal of it mm-hmm. because jones was at, he was not any anybody in the cia would see jones's mentality very quickly but they they may have been observing the whole thing that's true because he grew so fast in his cult so I, I, I can't really argue that they weren't observing it, mm-hmm. but that, that, that he was an instrument of theirs, no. No real evidence of that whatsoever. Okay. Um, so what, what took place on the day of the massacre? How, uh, how, how, did, how were the events well, when, carried out? After, after he, his henchmen slayed that party and killed a lot of them, uh, Jones then told his people— Back at, at, at Jonestown, he's, uh, and people, people are a little confused about this. Why would all these people commit suicide? Well, Jones then told them that he heard that somebody had killed Congressman Ryan. That's what he told them. Somebody had killed him. And then he said, you know what that means? That means that all the authorities are, come, are going to come down here and land on us. And we're going to be in deep trouble. And so he then, they had really have been rehearsing this mass suicide over the years in, in, in a kind of a, uh, a charade type thing where he, they wouldn't know if it was really poison or not. But they were also devoted with him that they went through drinking it. But it turns out it didn't have cyanide in it. But they were 
preparing for this. And so he then said, it went into the same thing and said, now we're going to drink our Kool-Aid. It was actually Flavor-Aid, but people call it Kool-Aid. And, and so they were so brainwashed and so afraid and so just terrified of what was, of what was going to happen when the authorities were all going to come down on him, he convinced them that they were be better off dead. And and, and, uh, and because they had rehearsed this so many times, yeah. they really didn't know if this was another rehearsal or the true. real thing. They, they, uh, I think none of them really knew that this was the actual poison that they were ingesting. And so that's how he's, in a way, he was able maybe to get many of them. But it wasn't long because cyanide is a very terrifying poison. A lot of people were seeing what was happening after some of them drank it. And so I think, I think most of the people then uh, were, were, uh, were just uh, aware that this is the real thing. But they were so desperate and helpless and just absolutely, it, it, it's just very clear to me that they were out of their minds with, with desperate fear and, and, and chose and thought that suicide would be the best way out. That's not to say that all of them would, because some of them... Uh, started to rebel and wouldn't drink it, but then they were forced to. Were, were, were uh, they were forced to uh, at the point of uh, gunpoint? Did anybody escape? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the two attorneys that were there escaped. Yeah, they they took care of themselves. And uh, Tim Reiterman, the uh, journalist that I had been working with, <coughs> he escaped. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and several others wandered off into the jungle. I don't know all of them, but uh, but but the of course you know nine hundred and eight of them just died. And, um, uh, David, we, I got about uh, eight or ten minutes remaining here. I want to I want to talk. I want to bring this fast forward to the present time. You said at the beginning that uh, you thought this cult would reemerge later on a national scale. And you believe that it did with the appearance of Barack Obama yeah. as a national leader. Uh, not this cult would reemerge. Right. But they the said, spirit, the spirit of this cult. Cult mentality would reemerge. And, and, and because nobody ever really studied w what allowed Jones to go that far. And so the, the public was unaware of the cult mentality. And, of course, we know that that cult mentality in, in, in California went on and on. You know, wh wh I, I didn't mention that one of uh, Jones's buddies back then was, uh, was uh, Governor Jerry Brown, who spoke from his uh, pulpit also. And so it turns out, ironically, that the whole crowd grew and festered and grew. And finally, you, you see what a radical uh, political element is running California now. And I tie it directly to that crazy uh, liberal uh, cult mentality that established itself pretty strongly in San Francisco with, with Jim Jones's help. And so now we've got crazy things like... Uh, uh, saying that uh, you know it's a, it's 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 a law now where uh, a, a high school kid could go into uh, a boy could go into the girl's bathroom mm -hmm. if he feels like a girl. You probably read about that. Sure. So uh, I mean, when, when radio host insane. Michael when when radio host Michael Savage says liberalism is a mental illness, he's not kidding. It is. It really is. It does create a form of insanity. Yes, Michael Savage invited me on his radio show uh, oh, about, well, that was back at the 30th anniversary of Jim Jones. And he, uh, he invited, he had Lester Kinsolving and me on his show. So uh, Michael Savage, in some ways, he's very astute on this kind of stuff. This meant, uh, and, and I, of course, I've, I've felt all along over the years that this extreme liberalism, progressivism, is a cult mentality. It's no, no doubt about it whatsoever. What are the signs that you see that's present right now in the United States related to Barack Obama? The very first key sign of a cult mentality is the inability to see the obvious. And that was very apparent 
in uh, in uh, Barack Obama. He, in a, it, it was obvious that he was into himself and that he was really not had no real concern about anything going on except his own rising up through the political power structure. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. He uh, and, and here's another sign, uh, kind of not too understood, I think, by people, maybe some cult experts understand it, but it, 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 there, 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 is, there is this question of seeing the self as, as, the, as the major thing that's going on, rather than caring what's going on out in the, in, in the public arena. So, so you're, 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 are you referring to Obama's narcissism? Y- yes, yes, narcissism and charisma, uh, because his charisma had to be there to allow him to get that far. That's another parallel he had with Jim Jones. I've got several parallels between uh, Obama and Jim Jones, by the way, if you want to go into them later. No, I mean, I'll tell you what, I'm going to, you you just, uh, I'm going to extend a few more minutes. I want to hear what you have about Mr. Obama. Okay. Uh, First off, uh, Jones uh, Jones captured the the media and the, uh, and Obama captured the media. Jones uh, had a strange childhood: a father, a drunk, a mother uh, that had to fend for itself, and and uh, and so Jimmy Jones he he was very lonely and not really looked after by a father figure. He uh, Jones ended up as a highly egocentric, narcissistic, charismatic man. He would do and say anything that would get him ahead. No real and deep-seated principles, and that's obvious. And the same way, uh, Obama attacked the lone media organization that began researching him critically, talk shows and their pundits going on Fox News. Obama captured and captivated the rest of the media. One of them was so in love with Obama that he, Chris Matthews, lost his cool and said he got a tingle up his leg. Mm -hmm. Obama also captured and captivated the politicians and even moderate Democrats, those that were uh, ordinarily fairly sane and seemed to have they seem to have fallen blindly before this blazing young political messiah. And Obama had also had a very strange childhood. You know, father deserted him, uh, the child, when he was two years old. Obama's only father figure was a terribly nasty old man, a pornographer and a child molester and a cocaine user who was uh, an avowed communist. Oh, so uh, Frank, Frank Marshall Davis. Yeah, right. Yeah, we could go into that. How mm-hmm. weird he was, and uh, and even he's even. I. It's pretty well established that Frank Marshall Davis was the one that got Obama into cocaine. And uh, and also both of them, Jones and Obama, had a background of community organizing, mingled with radical and terrorists, and. Uh, and also, the, the, we, we had some evidence that Jones was connected with uh, some some of the radical terrorist groups back then. But Obama, for sure, was connected with uh, terrorists, you know, like... Uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, Bill Ayers. Yeah, uh, Cass Sunstein. Sunstein, yes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, what's his wife's name? I forgot. Uh, Bernadine... Uh, Bernadine Dern, Dorn. Dern, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, both... And then there was another one. Uh, uh, he had another. There was another terrorist group out of that. Don, I'm sorry, uh, David. What about what about the way you know early in the 2008 campaign, you know, people were fainting in the presence of Obama. <laughs> they used to do that with Jones too. He had an enormous influence over people. He would wave his hand, and they would be slain in the spirit and. Uh, no, uh, uh, it's, it, you cannot exaggerate what a remarkable thing, you know, the combination of charisma and narcissism 
can do with people. Well, David, let me ask you this. Uh, if this uh, spirit that was on, this evil spirit that was on Jim Jones, if it is present with Barack Obama and it descends on the country on a national scale, what what possibly could happen? Well, I think, well, that allows me then to go into an example of what can happen. Because you see, one thing about a cult leader is that from then on, he will appoint only people with his same cult mentality in charge of all the enterprises that he's got going. That's the only people he will. He won't appoint people with normal, sensible mentalities that will get about the business of doing the right thing. And that's why I believe, and and this is a major point that I just wanted to make fairly recently because of, of what happens on on uh, Obamacare and what he and what the president had to say this morning the reason Obamacare is the major failure that it is is because everyone that is connected with it were appointees of a cult leader like uh, like Obama with the same mentality and they have no idea how to do things right but they do have a powerful idea on how to pull off his major agenda, which is this radical, radical uh, uh, leftist uh, and uh, an almost ter- ter- terrifying uh, agenda. So their expertise is in deception and revolution. Exactly. They have learned to lie ferociously. You know, uh, I, 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 I made a, an amazing warning back in 2006 uh, when when I first saw uh, Obama. And, and as, it, as it fleshed out and became more obvious, I then said in an article that was uh, pub, pub, publicized on uh, the San Diego State University's uh, Jonestown website, I said that uh, Obama is... Is is the reemergence of of Jim Jones type of of, of uh, cult mentality, and I and I warned that uh, he, he he would end up as as far more dangerous than Jim Jones, and this was printed back in uh, in two thousand. Eight. I wrote the article in the winter of two thousand seven, two thousand eight, but it was published on the San Diego State University's website, where I warned that uh, that uh, it, it, that that Obama would be far more dangerous than Jones had the, had, had a similar cult mentality, not quite as pathological, but nevertheless. So David, what what do you think could happen? Uh, if, if this uh, cult mentality of Barack Obama is allowed to run its course unfettered, oh, I, can't, I, 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 you know, I keep most of this to myself. I, I don't even want to. I am reluctant to say that I think we're pretty much done for. In fact, I've said it. I think there's only a seventy percent, uh, a thirty percent chance that we're going to survive. There's a 70 percent chance that we're seeing the end of everything that America stood for. I really believe that. I say that almost every day on this program. So you're not shocking our audience. So you can go ahead. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Now, you can go ahead and, and, and express yourself on this, because this is where this is where I'm at. I believe I, I don't I used to say we're on the edge of the cliff. Well, now I think we went over the cliff. And, yeah, you know, uh, uh, well, then I think your audience may be pretty much into thinking what, what what I really believe and that, and I, and I said this back in 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 that same article uh uh Jonestown its poor tent has arrived that was the name of that article people can see that on the internet Jonestown its poor tent has arrived I said that that Obama is the leader of a massive cult himself he's the leader of the cult and the cult is Islam, and he leads it by way of being 
its major Western world defender. And uh, it's just that simple. You, you, and, believe, you believe that Barack Obama is leading an Islamic cult inside America, that he, he is... He is conditioning America to yes. open itself up to Islamic uh, culture and, and beliefs. And people can can go back and see how many uh, Muslims were brought over uh, to to uh, you know after you know the the wars in the Middle East. How many have come over? And many of them, of course, established you uh, know themselves up in in Michigan. And that's why. Uh, the the uh, the cult establishment of uh, Sharia of the Islamic law is being uh, is starting to be institutionalized there. Is and, is Barack Obama leading America to a cultural suicide? Oh yes. I mean a, a cultural Jonestown massacre. Yes, that's that's why I said he's far more dangerous because already what's going on has caused I think enormous amounts of people. Uh, who have just lost everything they've had, and and, uh, and, and, and who knows how many suicides? Uh, it's 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 just a it's just a devastating thing on on America. It does seem, you know, in recent years, there's like a mass insanity that's sweeping the land. That's right, and 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 that insanity, by the way, is what I said. This is the key key element of of occult mentality: the inability to see the obvious. And, and, and it's just uh, amazing why people could not see the obvious of what's going on. It it, it just uh, it just blows me away. It's so obvious, but it's 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 run by a, a powerful cult like establishment that is in, in control and it it has its power over the media and if anybody gets out of line they really get torn apart i mean and uh, Fox uh, news is all already yielding a little bit to it uh, sure they're all they're all intimidated by it i mean look look at the you know at, at the budget uh, you know the government shut down in early october where you had mr obama Telling the leaders of the Congress, I will not negotiate with you, period. Do as I say. And you had grown right. men and women in the United States Congress who did not challenge him, who did not say to him, excuse me, but we were elected also, and you're going to have to uh, cut some spending. Nobody would do it. Yeah. And, and they, they just marched in lockstep like, like zombies and gave right. him the power. Just exactly like, like cult members follow the leader, and the, and they're just absolutely p part of them are in fear, and they don't know what to do. Uh, it, it, is is he becoming an Adolf Hitler? Oh, sure. Uh, in a, in a, of course, in an obviously different way his approach to undermining everything that the country stands for is is a different approach he he's uh he's he's the extremist uh on 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 the radical liberal side you know the marxist side mm -hmm. and socialism and all that but he, but, but, but in essence he's persuading the american people to drink cultural political financial cyanide they're already gulping it in just big gulps of it, going down all over the place. It's so pathetic. I, 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 I just hardly know how to deal with it. The irony is, I went, I went seven years before getting the attention to the media on Jim Jones. I went seven and a half years of my nine years investigation before the mass murder, and uh, even then. They, they they got on to him because I was informed on that far through my investigation, 18 months before the mass murder. I was informed on. And Jones then found out everything that I had on him. And so he threatened my life. And uh, I went into hiding for 18 months uh, and continued my investigation and stuff. But uh, he, he, he then went to the media and as Obama is doing, really, he's blaming the whole thing on other people. He never once ever even hinted that it is due to him, his fault. 
no no way was it anything to do with his fault. Same which which with, is another another sign of of the mental illness. Oh yeah, I've got, Jones did the same thing. He blamed his his cult being damaged. He he went to the San Francisco media and blamed me as a person who's trying to de- destroy his his church. He said, David, I got I got one minute remaining. Uh, you were right in two thousand six in your warning. You you said Obama is the reemergence of Jim Jones mentality. Uh, you said he's going to be the leader of an Islamic cult. You said that in 2006. So in 2013, um, w- w- knowing what you know about cults and watching Obama, what do you think we're going to be talking about in you know two years, five years from now about what has happened to this country? Can well, you sum it up in one minute? Well, I believe that we're... It, it, that that far in the future, I believe they're going. We're going to look back and see a major misdirection of this country to the point where it's never going to recover to the, to what it used to be. There's no doubt about that. So ever he's already entrenched himself with this cult mentality, and the liberals are just not able to wake up and and see it honestly. They cannot see the facts of what's going on. They're unable to see the obvious, and therefore it's going to go to outrageous extremes. And like I say, I, I think only a, a, a 30% chance that we'll even survive as a nation. I mean, we're not going to ever survive as the nation that we used to be. So the damage is irreparable. My guest, Mr. David Kahn, And uh, he co-authored a book in 1980 called The Cult That Died, The Tragedy of Jim Jones. And his uh, latest book uh, just released, The Pleasure of Fiends, An Orthodox Study of Evil and the Meaning in the Jonestown Cultic Horror. Uh, Mr. Khan's website is truthsleuth.net. David, thank you so much for this interview. Okay, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Well, i got to be totally frank with you. I was not prepared for where this interview uh, went today. I, When I first invited Mr. Khan to come on the program, it was because the 35th anniversary of the Jim Jones massacre was coming up in the month of November. And uh, I simply wanted him to talk about uh, what happened and, uh, you know, to, to educate us about, about these religious cults. I was not expecting him to draw a connection between Jim Jones and Barack Obama. And so what we've learned here today is that uh, Barack Obama has all of the markings of Jim Jones. He is a cultist. Now this makes sense of why people were fainting in 2008. And just a few weeks ago, we had, remember the pregnant woman who fainted? That was completely staged. Watch the YouTube video. You will see that it was a completely staged fake fainting spell. This man is a lunatic. He, he, is, he is a cultist. He is like Jim Jones. He wants people to worship him. He wants people to believe he has this aura that when he walks into the room, people become lightheaded and they fall down in his presence. These are all the signs of, of, a, of a mentally demented psychopath, a man who has the potential of becoming an Adolf Hitler. Well, it's uh, been an amazing uh, interview today, and I hope this has uh, been enlightening to you. Please uh, do what you have to do to spread this program around on the Internet. Uh, Get it on your Facebook pages and tell your friends about it. Email it around. Hey, last uh, call. We're at the end of the week, the end of the month. We need your support for True News. Go to our website, truenews.com. Make the very best donation you can or get a check or money order in the mail. God bless you. We, We thoroughly thank God for our supporters, our our family of friends who support this ministry. Take care. Bye.